Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all again to our Lenten series, our second in four, three speakers and one film, actually four speakers. Again, welcome um, to this annual series, and we encourage you to, if you can, come to some of the others, and we'll talk more about them at the end. Uh, this evening, we will have a guest speaker from St. Louis University, and he is a professor, assistant professor in the political science department at St. Louis University. It is William A. McCormick II, SJ. Um, Bill McCormick is actually a Jesuit scholastic, which means uh, in the Jesuit formation process, after you finish your philosophy studies, you usually spend two or three years in regency. So he is not yet ordained a priest yet, but he does have his PhD. He had done his studies at the University of Texas in Austin, and he has his PhD. He will do three years. He's in his second of his third year. And then after he finishes, he then goes on to theology studies and eventually on to ordination and then eventually to placement full time, ideally at a university just sort of like Loyola University, New Orleans. <laughs> but we never know. You know, we, if we invite him back enough, we think maybe he'll really find this place to be a place that he'll feel welcome to. He did spend two summers here working at the JSRI, the Jesuit Research, Social Research Institute, and so he has been working with Father Fred Kammer, who was our speaker last week. Um, we tried this year to focus on terms that Jesuits use a lot in Ignatian spirituality, the whole idea of what we call Jesuitica, and so he is going to speak tonight on magnanimity, and it's a term that's not really widely known and hopefully he'll explain what it is and why it isn't. So I'd like to introduce Father Bill. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry, Dr. Bill. He's not a priest yet, he can't be. Sorry, Bill. Well, thank you so much, Bishop Deziak. <laughs> while, we're, while we're promoting people, try to be egalitarian about that. Well, thanks so much for having me here. We, we've had a very bitter winter in St. Louis, and I'm a delicate South Texan, uh, so it's nice to be here in the, uh, the gentle southern sunshine. And I'm especially grateful to be here at Loyola University in New Orleans. I've really enjoyed my time at St. Louis University. I think it's an institution, a ministry of the Society of Jesus that really captures what we're about, what the Jesuit Ministry of Higher Education is about. So the, my time there has just been a wonderful confirmation of the Society of Jesus' commitment to places like Loyola University in New Orleans. So Father Deziak, I could easily see myself in the future at a place like Loyola <laughs> University in New Orleans. So God willing. So thank you for allowing me to be here with you all this evening. Perhaps we could begin with a brief prayer from the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, you have made us to serve you. You have made us with great gifts, great spirits, and above all, great desires to be one with you. Let us in gratitude recognize the gifts you have given us and in hope strive to use them for your kingdom where we can live with you and our brothers and sisters forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As a Jesuit and a political scientist, I have the distinct pleasure of spending a lot of time thinking about the spiritual condition of our, of our life together, of our public life together in the political square. And there have been, uh, and of course I have plenty of fodder with which to work as you can imagine. Politics is always boring, but the past few years it's gotten a little more interesting. There have uh, been many diagnoses of where we are today as a society, where we are as a culture, and I want to offer yet another one, but it's the best one, right? The other ones will be left behind in the dust. And it involves, my diagnosis of where we are as a society involves a little known virtue that serves as the title of this talk, magnanimity. Many people today in the United States feel helpless and hopeless. They feel trapped by institutions, structures, 
and processes that are beyond their control. They feel exploited, manipulated, and even abandoned by powerful political and economic forces. They feel hopeless and despairing. They feel trapped. And this is something I submit that affects all Americans. A particularly potent example of this dynamic emerged last week. I'm sure you, you heard about it. Education is valuable in our society and is seen as crucial to getting ahead in life. Uh, news broke last week, however, that uh, certain celebrities in Hollywood have been bribing their way into elite colleges, or rather bribing uh, their children's way into elite colleges, using money and privilege to secure what others cannot, despite their hard work. For many, that news was proof that the system is rigged, that you can work as hard as you want in the United States, but the privilege and power of some will always carry them farther than one's own hard work and merit. As if that weren't bad enough, this dynamic seems to be tragically true within the church as well. Since Pentecost, Christians have struggled along the pilgrim way to the kingdom. A Vatican II reminded us that every member of the church is called by virtue of his or her own baptism to holiness. As Lumen Gentium reads, all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, are called by the Lord, each in his own way, to that perfect holiness whereby the Father himself is perfect. This, of course, is the famous universal call to holiness of Vatican II. This call to holiness means we are all part of the church, that we all must play a part in the upbuilding of the kingdom, and that the church must serve us all. Building God's kingdom is not just a task for priests or scholastics or bishops or cardinals or even popes. And the church does not serve just, does not exist, excuse me, just to serve those people. It should serve all of God's people. That's the challenge of this line, this powerful line from Lumen Gentium. Yet many people feel just as powerless within the church as they do within society writ large. A particularly tragic example comes the past year. Uh, throughout the global church, the sins of sexual abuse by clergy have revealed deep wounds among the faithful. Clerics preying upon the most vulnerable within the church, abusing the trust placed in them for their own pleasure. To make matters worse, as is well known, bishops, religious superiors, and even lay leaders have hushed up these crimes, preferring to put children and vulnerable adults at further risk, rather than allowing these clerics to face the just punishment of their heinous crime. They chose the image of the institutional church over the safety of its members. Yes, we have many good priests, many good bishops. Can't say that enough. We even have two good popes, a unique moment in history, or a pope and a pope emeritus, however you, you want to dice that. Uh, but cases like that of Theodore McCarrick, I think, remind us that some in church leadership are not interested in holiness, but in power, privilege, and prerogative. And many of the faithful of the church feel similarly trapped by those structures of power and privilege. Now, this is not the happiest way to start this talk. And you might be wondering why I have called these sad facts to mind. Well, I've done it because they fit a common narrative of how we see the world that uh, I think is wrong. We often think of the world in terms of the haves and have-nots. We look at the money that some have and others do not. We see the power that some have and some do not. We see the privilege and authority that some have and others do not. But when I look around the world, that's not what I see. I actually see something that everyone is lacking, and that something is magnanimity. Now you're wondering, what is magnanimity, right? So I'll tell you. But a simple example comes from a recent movie, The Green Book. Has anyone seen The Green Book? Wonderful. So some of you will, will know what I'm talking about. Uh, the movie is based on the life of Don Shirley, a brilliant African-American pianist who took a bold risk by touring the South. He did a, a tour of the South in the 1960s. Uh, and this movie chronicles that tour. The movie has a lot of problems, and we're not going to talk about those today. Uh, because despite some of its difficulties, the movie nevertheless portrays a very powerful spiritual dynamic of Shirley's character. 
You see, every racial, political, social, and economic structure was set against Don Shirley. Yet Shirley courageously ventured into the South to make a statement about the intrinsic dignity of African Americans as human beings. In the movie, Shir Shirley experiences the contradictions of being both desired for his musical talents, but also rejected as a human being with the dignity of a child of God. The people in the movie allow him to play in their rarefied, exclusive cultural environs, but they won't let him use the indoor bathroom. That's the definition of exploitation there. Now this dynamic of exploitation comes to a head on the last show of his tour at a restaurant in the Deep South. The restaurant has gone to great lengths to secure Shirley's uh, performance as the centerpiece of their Christmas Eve program, but they will not serve him at that very restaurant. So Shirley takes a stand. Serve me at this restaurant or I will not play. The management doesn't budge, and therein they reveal the deep evil, the deep sin at the core of their souls. And Shirley sees that evil and refuses to be complicit in it. They refuse to serve him dinner, so he refuses to play. The restaurant does not get their show, and Shirley is not complicit in their racist structures. He takes a stand for himself, and he takes a stand for all African Americans. Shirley exemplifies the magnanimity I'm talking about tonight. In a difficult situation, in an impossible situation, he strives for greatness, and he strives for greatness for the benefit of other people. The cost is not considerable, and he's not a Pollyanna about it. He knows that he will suffer. Uh, but he's willing to endure that suffering. He's willing to bear that cost for the common good. And that's magnanimity. At its simplest, magnanimity means uh, what its Latin roots suggest. I know everybody here knows Latin, so I can just skip that part. Uh, but of course, it comes from the words magna anima, right? Great spirit. And with great spirit, one can do great things. For Christians particularly, it is the disposition to do great things for God. In the service of God, it is an active commitment to the Lord's prayer, thy will be done. Christianity has always depended upon the willingness of people to do great things for God. The 12 disciples left everything to become fishers of men. Our Lady not only took on the magnanimous task of following her son, but she exhorted Christ himself to magnanimity at the wedding at Cana. Christian civilization in the West was built by men and women with the vision to build cathedrals, form law codes, share mystical visions, paint and sculpt beautiful uh, artwork, found religious orders, and even govern countries in the service of God. One of my favorite examples of magnanimity on this continent was the Dominican Bartolomé de las Casas, who, as you know, stood up against the Spanish Empire to protect the rights of indigenous persons. These were all acts of greatness, and they all served God. Some of this greatness was done by the rich and powerful, like kings who built cathedrals or popes who united the church. But what's amazing about Christianity is magnanimous acts were so often, and are now, so often done by the seemingly weak, by people that the rest of the world discards, people like Joan of Arc or Francis of Assisi. Indeed, Christian magnanimity means trusting God can do great things with us, with our service despite our own smallness. As Mother Teresa famously said, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. If we look at our situation in the world today, I think we see many people lacking magnanimity in two distinct ways. We see the powerless with good intentions to act, but no power and many powerful people unfortunately using their power for evil. Those two ways correspond to what the tradition calls vainglory or vanity and false humility. Vainglory is the desire to be esteemed highly by others. It's the desire for empty glory, for human glory rather than God's glory. As Ignatius says, Satan will tempt us 
with riches, honors, and pride. These temptations are particularly potent for those who seek to be highly regarded by other people. Many powerful people today are unfortunately vainglorious. They seek wealth, they seek fame, they seek fortune. We see this all the time on Twitter, uh, on TV, in the movies, on the internet. But these people do not seek these things for good. They seek them for their own selfish ends. But I suspect many of us here are not vainglorious, so we'll put that problem to the side for now. Now, false humility is a more subtle problem because humility is a good thing. Uh, but false humility is a distortion of humility that has insidious properties. Hum humility is a wonderful virtue. It's the foundation of all the other virtues because it helps us see who we are before God, who we are before our fellow brothers and sisters. But false humility leads us to denigrate our own goodness. It leads us to believe that the gifts God has given us are not enough for the work before us. We shrink from doing great things because our souls have shrunk. But as Jesus says, don't hide your light under a bushel basket. I think many people today suffer from false humility. We see ourselves as powerless and defenseless against forces greater than us. But I just really want to emphasize when we lean into that uh, powerlessness, when we embrace that sense of passive failure to resist, that we come quite close to denying that God has given us gifts to cooperate with him in the world. We come quite close to denying that we can be his hands and feet in the world. We come quite close to denying that he has made us good. And yet he has made us good. Again, I said that false humility and vainglory are different ways to fail or to, to fail to achieve magnanimity. If magnanimity is the desire to undertake great things for God, false humility denies that we can do great things for God. Vainglory also denies that, but then turns to its own selfish ends. I can't do great things for God, but I will do great things for myself. Magnanimity fights back against both false humility and vainglory. It resists the despair of false humility and offers hope that we can do great things for God, and precisely, precisely because God himself is great. Now, if you are following me so far and agree with me, then you will agree with me that magnanimity is not only crucially important, but it's also critical that we recover it in our time for the church and the world. So I'd like to spend a few minutes asking a little more deeply, what is magnanimity and how can we better cultivate it? There's no better time to do that than during Lent. I'm a Jesuit, so you're probably expecting me now to turn to St. Ignatius of Loyola, uh, so I will humor you in that desire. Uh, and indeed, St. Ignatius has a great deal to teach us about magnanimity. It's at the root of his spirituality, the ad maiorum de gloria, right? The AMDG, the magus, the sushipe, the principle and foundation, all speak to the greatness to which we are called for, through, and in God. As you probably know, the young Ignatius was plagued by vainglory. He was obsessed with human glory in the same way that he would later become obsessed with God's glory. Th this is a love uh, for human glory manifest in the very first sentence of his autobiography. Up to his 26th year, he was a man given to worldly vanities, and having a vain and overpowering desire to gain renown, he found special delight in the exercise of arms, meaning, of course, uh, military activity. That exercise of arms led to his most famous example of this vainglory, a story many of you probably know, his recovery from the cannonball injury at the Battle of Pamplona. His leg bones set in an unsightly way, and so he was so vain that he asked the doctor to re-break his leg and then reset it. I've heard this story so many times, but it never fails to astonish. Such vanity that he didn't like the way his le broken leg was set. So he asked the doctors to break his leg again and reset it. That is quite a commitment to vanity. That is quite a commitment to the opinion of other people. And this vainglory continued in his convalescent reveries, as you know, as he imagined the great ways he would serve a lady 
when he finally recovered from his injury. But Ignatius came to see that these worldly things that had so long held him captive now left him dry and unhappy. And his vision, his picture of what greatness looked like changed considerably. It became less about the honor, repute, respect of other human beings and became more about the honor and glory he could give to God that he could help show for God. So this vainglory led him to learn about the discernment of spirits. And it was this magnanimity that really led him to embrace, again, one of his most famous teachings on the discernment of spirits. So given the importance of vainglory and magnanimity to Ignatius' own life, it's no surprise that it's central to his spirituality. Um, and a very famous reference to magnanimity comes in Annotation 5 in the Spiritual Exercises. So this is supposed to be a beautiful slide uh, for you to rest your eyes on between quotations, but leaving that alone for the next one, <laughs> just to keep me humble. Uh, the, so this is a uh, Annotation 5 from the Spiritual Exercises. The persons who make the exercises will benefit greatly by entering upon them with great spirit and generosity, grande animo y liberalidad, liberalidad, excuse me, toward their creator and Lord, and by offering all their desires and freedom to him so his divine majesty can make use of their persons and of all they possess in whatsoever way is in accord with his most holy will. These are notes that are supposed to prepare us for the spiritual exercises. And so here, St. Ignatius is asking us to enter into the exercises as a great undertaking. It is not something to take up lightly. Rather, we should give all our desires and freedom so that God can put them in his service. This is the magnanimity of the Sushapre prayer, right? Daring to give all that we have to God and trusting that what he gives back to us will be enough. That's why Ignatius links magnanimity in this passage to a generosity or liberality. Liberality is an open-handed disposition to give and share of what one has. Here, Ignatius spiritualizes liberty, liberality, conceiving it as a spiritual offering, one of all their desires and freedoms. There's also a, a connection, as you can see here, to love. So now I'll give you the the timeout slide. It's very beautiful. The spiritual, exercises lead, the spiritual exercises lead us to a closer relationship with Christ. That is the point of the exercises, an encounter with Christ Jesus. Indeed, Ignatius is confident that the encounter with Jesus through the exercises will enkindle a love that draws us out of ourselves, draws us out of ourselves to other people in loving, fruitful actions and words. In other words, it's God's love that motivates us to magnanimity. It's God's love that draws us out to do great things for other people and for him. But it's magnanimity that reinforces our own acts of love. It's magnanimity that predisposes us to give even more and more and more of ourselves to God. And that's why, for St. Ignatius, I tend to think of magnanimity fundamentally as a spirit of loving cooperation with God, a loving, humble cooperation with God. Our love of God should lead us to do great things in his service. Magnanimity as loving cooperation with God is what we see in the opening passages of the Constitutions of the Society of Jesus, a famous document of mine. Uh, did I just say a famous document of mine? I did not write it. It's a favorite document of mine. Uh, there is some dispute as to who, which, which, which passages of the Constitution, but I wrote none of them. I, well, just, you heard it here first. It's not a question you needed to be answered. Uh, but an opening passage that describes the reasons St. Ignatius founded the society. And it shows that magnanimous love is humble. And that's what makes this so big. Although God, our creator and Lord, is the one who in his supreme wisdom and goodness must preserve, direct, and carry forward in his divine service this least society of Jesus, just as he deigned to begin it. And although on our own part what helps most toward this end must be, more than any exterior constitution, the interior love of charity and love which the Holy Spirit writes and imprints upon our hearts, nevertheless, 
Since the gentle disposition of divine providence requires cooperation from his creatures, and since, too, the vicar of Christ our Lord has ordered this, and since the examples given by the saints and reason itself teach us so in our Lord, we think it necessary that Constitution should be written to aid us to proceed better in conformity with our Institute along the path of divine service on which we have entered. You got that? It's a mouthful, but it's a beautiful divine mouthful that I did not write. This passage underlies, excuse me, underlines the intrinsic connection between magnanimity and humility. This is the document founding uh, the, the Society of Jesus, and yet he begins it with a reminder that God governs the universe, that God created the universe, that God created humans. So Christians must accept with humility the providence of a God active in the world, a God who continues to speak. And so Ignatius affirms, even in this document about human governance of the society, the supremacy of divine governance. But it's amazing. It's, it suffuses this text that this is not a humility that binds us, that imprisons us, that limits us, that holds us back and makes us slaves. As many critics of Christianity have offered, you know, especially Nietzsche criticized this for this. Rather, this is a humility that liberates Christians. It's a humility that sets us free. The humility that allows the Jesuit or any Christian to acknowledge his or her dependence upon God is the very basis of his or her magnanimous service to God. And we see that in its caritas, the interior law of charity and love of the Holy Spirit, which draws together humility and magnanimity. For it is that spirit that guides the society and guides the whole church. So a beautiful passage about magnanimity, humility, charity, and their inner connection. So somehow, and this is really the thoroughly Ignatian moment in this text, despite God's greatness, there is still room for human action. Because of God's greatness, there is room for human action. He wants us to cooperate with him. He wants to be our friends. That's why he came to earth and became flesh. And so God's supremacy does not mean that humans should be servile. It does not mean we should be passive. It means we should be bold and courageous in our cooperation with the Lord. I'm getting better at that. A third and final example of Ignatian magnanimity is the incarnation meditation. The incarnation meditation, as many of you know, invites the retreatant to observe the people on earth, the way they speer, speak, the way they appear, how they act, what they say, and to observe them in the same way that the Trinity contemplates the world. The meditation invites us into the mystery whereby God the Father sends down God the Son to redeem the world, to see the world the way God sees the world, to love the world the way God loves the world. This grace of the incarnation meditation, to see the world as God sees it, is critical to the virtue of magnanimity. For magnanimity allows Christians to have hope in God's providence. Fundamentally, magnanimity, as that cooperation with God, is a hope in God's providence. Because to see the world as God sees it is to see creation as redeemable. In fact, to see that it has been redeemed through the incarnation, through the life, the passion, the death of Christ Jesus. And it is in that vision of the world as redeemed that we can be magnanimous, that we can act knowing that our actions mean something, that the Lord is working with us, protecting us, guiding us. This is a very hopeful vision of the world. As the Jesuit Peter Schneller notes, Ignatian, Ignatius had a very hopeful view of the world, thinking it scripturally as a vineyard where the fruit is plentiful and requires only laborers with the magnanimity to harvest it. So I'd like to think also about mag magnanimity as not only a way to be in the world, but to see the world. Now, you might have heard of this guy, Pope Francis. 
Everybody heard of him? Great. One of the more famous Jesuits out there right now. Uh, he offers a metaphor of the church frequently as a field hospital. Again, a very dense quote, I apologize. I see clearly that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. You have to start from the ground up. The church sometimes has locked itself up in small things, in small-minded rules. The most important thing is the first proclamation, Jesus Christ has saved you. And the ministers of the church must be ministers of mercy above all. It's an incredible metaphor for the church, incredible at the field hospital that we, the first important thing is this first proclamation that Jesus Christ has saved you. Now the field hospital might seem a dismal metaphor for the church, and some people have interpreted it as so, but in fact, I think it's quite hopeful. I think it's an invocation of St. Ignatius's image of the vineyard, which is little short of the Garden of Eden. As I already said, quoting Schneller, St. Ignatius urged in his spirituality for Christians to see creation as the vineyard of the Lord. That vision, he hoped, would give us the courage and freedom to act in that vineyard. Now, if you're a Jesuit or have been around Jesuits, you've heard about this metaphor of the vineyard before. And I think it's important for us to recover its freshness, its urgency. It's a very powerful image, as uh, Peter Schneller discusses. As laborers in the vineyard, we make a difference in this world. We are involved in a living and life-giving project, a constructive task whose goal is to bear fruit for the Lord. We do not work alone. We are co-workers with God. Although we plant and water, it is God who gives the increase. We do not just pass through this life or simply weave baskets in the day and take them apart at night. I don't know who thinks that, but uh, it sounds bad, so I'm glad we don't do that. Rather, we are here to tend the garden and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The cultivator of a vineyard is committed to the long haul, to be patient, respectful cooperation with fellow laborers and with the Lord of the harvest. And so magnanimity understood through the vineyard is this fundamentally hopeful attitude trusting in God's control of history. The magnanimous person knows that his or her work will bear fruit despite human foibles, for God ultimately directs the work. And what's not completed in our lifetime will be completed in another one. What will be undone in our lifetime will be redone in another one. And the Lord of history will see to all of that. And so Ignatian magnanimity as this loving service, this loving, humble cooperation with the Lord is a way to live in the world as the vineyard. It's a way of seeing the world as this vineyard of the Lord. Emphasizing that it's the vineyard of the Lord reminds us that we are working for and with the Lord. This brings us back to the field hospital. The field hospital and the vineyard are both magnanimous visions of the world. They both center, they both, excuse me, center on a hope that our labors will triumph in the end because God will triumph in the end. So I think more than anything, magnanimity should challenge and change how we see the world. It should show us the gifts and opportunities that we routinely overlook in our own despair, in our own desolation, in our own sarcasm or irony or bitterness. God ensures our success, and that can be a source of great hope for us. And again, a source of great humility for us because we know we're persevering through him. One way to think about magnanimity, I realize at this point I've given you about 20 different definitions of magnanimity, but I want you to take home the one that sits best with you, right? The one that struck you and you can forget everything else. Um, but one way to think about magnanimity is the place where charity and humility meet. The place where charity and humility meet. 
uh, that magnanimity rests upon the humility that acknowledges that God is Lord of the universe. And it's fed, it's nourished, cultivated by the burning desire to serve him and to serve him alone. I think of magnanimity as this beautiful flower that blossoms because of this cross-pollination of humility and charity. Now, thinking back to our contemporary context, and I only have an hour left uh, to talk, so I better wrap this up. Thank you for laughing. My students never, never, <laughs> never, never laugh. But thinking back to our contemporary context, I said we can see people lacking magnanimity in two distinctive ways, false humility and vainglory. And the question you might ask is how have we become less, less magnanimous? How is it that we have this magnanimity deficit? I don't know. That's a really difficult question. Many of you can probably answer it a lot better than I can. But I do think it involves a distortion of our vision of the world. I do think it involves that somehow we've lost a vision of the, a creation as the vineyard, as this place where we have real possibilities for serving God. Most of us only see things that reinforce our despair, that obstructs us from seeing the vineyard. But I take hope. In many periods of history, people have been deeply oppressed, and yet they never lost their sense of creation as a vineyard. Most obviously in the United States during the Civil Rights era, for example, many people then knew that their oppression was wrong and that it had been wrong for centuries. They knew it was wrong, they named it as wrong, and they resisted it as wrong. Their resistance did not always prevail. There were many long, dark days. But like the children of Israel, they never accepted their servitude as natural. They never accepted their servitude as just. And they kept fighting for the promised land. They kept cultivating magnanimity. I thus see the call to magnanimity as a kind of exodus, a spiritual exodus for all of us. So I promised you I was down to my last few hours of talking. Um, if we're going to be magnanimous, I think we need to recover this vision of the vineyard. And how do we do that? I can't tell you that. Uh, I'm an academic, so my job is to tell you there's still more important questions that I need to publish articles to get out about. Uh, but I do want to leave you with three final thoughts. First, I really think that if recovering magnanimity is going to recover cultivating and balancing these two virtues that have kept coming up tonight, humility and charity. I'm going to say something very uh, reckless and intellectually irresponsible and say that I think most of Catholicism and Christianity has been this give and take between different polar tensions. And some days we're really good at emphasizing one part of our life and another, other times other parts. And I think there's a real divorce in our time between humility and charity. Uh, I think some of us are very humble without being very charitable. <laughs> and some of us are very charitable without being humble, if you can believe that. It might not be true. Please don't tell me if it isn't. Uh, but I think a divorce between humility and charity has a great deal to do with our present condition. Humility separated from the love of God is one of the ugliest things you can ever see. That humility separated from the love of God turns into self-loathing. It turns to a self-hatred. It turns to a, into a rejection of all the th gifts that God has given us and wants us to use for his people. Charity separated from humility can be deeply distorted by arrogance. First of all, it's not true charity. I understand that. Uh, but it can become deeply arrogant, and it can lord it over other people. We can appoint ourselves as prophets when we think we have this burning love for God that is totally unchecked by humility. Magnanimity, however, is the place where love and humility unite. It's the place where they reinforce each other. It's the place where we can recreate that vision of the vineyard. So that's my first homework for you, to uh, recover this balance between uh, charity and humility in our public life. A uh, second, we need magnanimity to reform institutions. Uh, when we talk about change in society and politics in the world, we're immediately confronted by the problem that the forces that oppress us that are sources of injustice are often faceless, nameless institutions with no one person in charge of them. 
and we can feel overwhelmed by them, that we have no power over them. But humans are the only ones who can reform institutions. We cannot wait for some magical day when institutions reform themselves without the help of human beings. The robots are not going to do it, I hate to tell you. That was a weird comment. Uh, Pope Francis has repeatedly urged that the best institutions in the world are ineffective without the right spirit animating them. We need magnanimity to reimagine institutions and to tackle the entrenched interests that benefit from their corruption. And by the way, we have to resist the allure of claiming institutions for our own gains. We need institutions to be reformed for the benefit of everybody. Pope Francis has had a great deal to say about the reform of the church, and he's urged a reform of church institutions based upon the missionary option, a church concerned for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. That's going to take fundamental magnanimity to reach beyond ourselves in loving, humble service and loving, humble, magnanimous acts uh, and deeds and words. But above all, Pope Francis has urged a magnanimous recovery of the fundamental nature of the church. More than an organic and hierarchical institution, he wrote, she is first and foremost a people advancing on its pilgrim way toward God. That brings me to my third and final point. Um, <clears throat> we need everyone in the church to be more magnanimous. Um, I think I've impressed that upon you by now. Uh, but we particularly need a more magnanimous laity. Uh, as I said before, Vatican II renewed for the entire church the universal call to holiness. But I think it's important that we see that universal call to holiness as a universal call to magnanimity. Along these lines, in 1983, the 33rd General Congregation of the Society for Jesus called for a truly apostolic laity, a truly apostolic laity, a laity that cultivates and lives out its distinct mission, its distinct responsibility and vocation in the church and in the world. Uh, recent events in the past years have reminded us that clericalism is the greatest manifestation of vainglory in the church today. I think the laity claiming, reclaiming their rightful place within the church and world is the most powerful antidote to clericalism we have, and I think it will require tremendous magnanimity. Ultimately, though, magnanimity rests upon the great virtue of St. Ignatius that I have thus far failed to mention gratitude. Every generation has to recognize gratefully the gifts God has given them, and they are many gifts, and every generation receives them. And we need to see that those gifts are not for our own personal pleasure, nor are they museum pieces to be cherished and bragged about. They need to be put to work in the world here and now. For many of us, letting go of false humility will require us to let go of this idea that we can't do very much for God, that it's other people's responsibility. Letting go of false humility will require us letting go of the, maybe the comfort and complacency with what we're doing right now. Now this is a Lenten talk, it's during Lent and I haven't mentioned Lent very much. So my challenge for you, I think for Lent, is that to give up this false humility and vainglory. And as an encouragement, let me repeat the simple but very powerful words of Mother Teresa that has guided me throughout this talk. Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Thank you very much. So I believe I'll take questions if there are any. One at a time, please. <laughs> My students also don't laugh at that one, so I'm very grateful. Yes, sir. I thought uh, toward the end there, you made some point that made me think of the decline of the family as the source mm. of, of increased hopelessness. People, uh, and uh, you don't have families growing up or not in a way that, that people can see their children grow and prosper and live. Mm. Uh, and I think the weakness of Mother Earth increased people
is a lack of hope. Absolutely. I think a great factor in our hopelessness as a society is that we see all of the structures of power as far away from us, as distant problems that we can't solve. And I think a lot of us have lost touch with the very close sources of hope in our daily lives, family, friendship, civic associations. If you've heard about bowling alone, that Americans feel more disconnected from ever from their local communities, from families, from friends. And it's positively true that magnanimity, like all good virtues, would have to begin at home. So I think that's an excellent point. And part of that, as I think our name is Red, she said that years ago we had kids with families, where families were very mm. much more all together. And today in our world, we so very much more separated with what we're living in different states and mm -hmm. not having that unit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's the challenge and opportunity that Pope Francis talks about with globalization, mm -hmm. that it allows us to connect to so many people around the world, and we have so much to learn from them. Every culture, every city, every religion, language, those are all powerful, powerful gifts, but it can't become superficial. We have to remain rooted and entrenched in realities and not kind of live this amorphous life where we're not actually tied down anymore. So I don't know if you've heard, he says that instead of the globe as a model for globalization, we should think of the polyhedron. <laughs> so just to take you back to geometry class, you know, the polyhedron is just a three-dimensional object with lots of different sides or facets, like a diamond. And so we should be united and connected while preserving the integrity, the distinctiveness of each part of the whole. And so if, if you remind yourself what a polyhedron is, I think it's a really beautiful, beautiful image. Responds to a lot of our problems. Yes, ma'am. I have to confess that I bristled a little bit when he got to the, the part about uh, the laity being magnanimous. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of laity have been and continue to be, but we're stifled by yeah. the, the structure, mm -hmm. the church structure. Oh, thank you. You wouldn't be I think. <laughs> in the position you were in if the church didn't just have magnanimity. They, 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 they couldn't possibly have any humility <coughs> and charity and let this happen to these people and, and the monks. So it, it's astounding that so fundamental an aspect of Christianity is absent in this church. And I agree with you. We have, you know, in this chapel with people like Father Vasek and and whatnot, we do have some growth, but it's been very hard, you know, for the laity to have voice, and when the laity has voice, like the group for 20 years that had been reporting to the Vatican about sexual abuse, mm -hmm. the reports were stopped before they got to the top, or got to the top and whatnot. So for something so fundamental to the church, the way you so eloquently describe it, it's astounding to me not despairing, but astounding that none of it's there. Do you, do you wish to comment on that? Well, I actually would rather not. I mean, I because <laughs> I love what, what you're saying, and I think the solution, first of all, I don't want to accuse the laity of not doing all of this no, work by themselves. No, you're not accusing them, challenging them, but if I understand you, right. it's hard. Right. It's very hard. And I guess, I guess my sort of invitation to you mm. is to do what you can make sure that you all are helping us with that yeah, which is part of yeah. is part of your charism obviously but but i think that we can all be more mindful of it mm -hmm. now there are things that we can all do to to help to help the others who are trying to right try to get their right and i didn't mean to be flip when i said i didn't want to comment but i think the most important thing people like me can do is listen uh, to lay people and hear what you're saying and take it seriously because I think there's been a tremendous amount of pride. I mean, there are all sorts of things, but there's been a great pride on the part of clerics that have kept them from listening and cooperating with the very real needs and concerns of the people of the church. 
So thank you very much for saying that. <laughs> so we agree. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Absolutely. You begin where you are. You said it very well. And uh, a lot of much wiser people have reflected on this problem than I have. But you're right. We're inundated with all kinds of information, stories about what's happening around the world. It can, can lead us to great interior pain, but it can also lead us to this very strange desensitization of, oh, another natural tragedy happened somewhere else, another couple of hundred people died, okay, well, that happens every day. And that's not good. Uh, but on the other hand, as you say, we have to start where we are. We have to grow where we're planted. And so, and we all have different gifts. I mean, some people are called to join the Peace Corps and to help people in other places. <laughs> but most of us, I think, are called to help and work and organize uh, where we are and to be a source of hope there. Um, and I think that goes back to the Don Shirley example where he was very aware of the racism, the structures of sin all over the South, all over the United States, and he kept, he kept pushing for justice where he was, where he could. And that takes tremendous, tremendous spiritual discipline, and it's only going to happen through God's grace, only through God's grace. I think I finished with me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I do hope that he would return and return to a school similar to Loyola University New Orleans one day <laughs> after he finishes his theological studies and continues on. Uh, and after ordination, he'll be looking for a job. So we'll be ready to lure him, perhaps. Of course, the problem is there are also 28 Jesuit universities out there also trying to lure him, but we hope that he remembers us. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, next week, we have a little bit of a different type of lecture. Um, some of you, hopefully many of you, know Flannery O'Connor, the Southern writer. Uh, we have a Jesuit from Georgetown University. His name is Mark Bosco. He is the vice president for mission at Georgetown. And he actually put together, with the help of several other people, a documentary about Flannery O'Connor. Um, I've heard rave reviews of it. Uh, PBS is interested in it. Uh, we're going to have Father Mark here on campus. It's co-sponsored through LIM, the Loyal Institute of Ministry. Um, rather than showing it here on this small little screen, um, we are showing it in Miller 114, which is Miller Hall is right next to the library. It's the College of Business Hall, uh, and it has a little bit of a better setting for us to show a film. But he will not only be there to present the film, but be open on commentary about the film. So again, I would encourage you to come. It will be at 7 o'clock, one week from tonight. Uh, in Miller 114. If you forget where it's at, we're going to have signs around this room. So if we walk in here and we say, oh, there's a couple of people that maybe should be walking over to Miller. So again, we welcome you. Thanks very much for coming. Two weeks from tonight, uh, we will have Father Vasek. And Father Vasek, I think, is here. There he is. He is going to be speaking on finding God in all things. What an appropriate term to use to close our Lenten series two weeks from tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.